Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our weekly podcast, Do More With Your Money. Today, it's very exciting. We've got updates on interest rates and how this is affecting the future for our clients, particularly on the back of inflation continuing to fall. I'm joined by our crack team here. We've got John, Fay, and Neil from both client servicing and from investments team. So there's plenty to update you on. Before we kick off, just a small update from us. We have a winner in the Moneyfax Awards for 2024. We won for best use of technology in the investment life and pension sector, as well as receiving three other commendations. So that's a great achievement by our technology and client servicing team. Well done, everyone there. So with that, we'll turn to markets face simply because we appear to be at the beginning of something new in terms of the interest rate regime. For the last several years, we've been used to interest rates going up, obviously, and going up more than perhaps we had expected, certainly some of our clients as well. So could you give us some updates, starting with the Bank of England? We're filming after the Bank of England's update today. So let's start here in the UK and then perhaps go on to the US. Yeah, sure. So had the Bank of England today, they held rates unchanged at 5%, which was what the market was expecting. Um, markets expecting a couple more cuts to come through this year. And remember as well, although they've not actually cut this time, they did um, they have previously cut already. Yeah, time. and it was a bit of a surprise, wasn't it, when they did cut in August? Yeah. So perhaps they've decided not to surprise yeah. twice yeah. in a row. Yeah. And, well, I suppose, you know, they have been successful in getting inflation down as well. And that's allowed them to previously cut rates. If you think back to uh, October 2022, I think it was, when inflation was at 11% at the peak, now down to 2.2%. So they've come quite a long way in getting that inflation down. But it's just the challenge of services inflation, really. Yes. Which is why they're kind of being a little bit cautious in wanting to not lower rates, you know, too aggressively. Yeah, so perhaps we won't see as many rate cuts as we've seen elsewhere yeah. in the world, but certainly going by some of the information we got today, there does seem to be a chance of further rate cuts before Christmas. So let's uh, let's go on to somewhere where there was a surprise, the US overnight. There was an interest rate cut there and it was more than the market expected. Yeah, yeah. so the market was kind of tossing up whether it'd be a 25 basis point or a 50 basis point cut, just given some of the mixed data. So you had, you know, data such as, you know, a surprise, uh, slightly higher than expected core inflation maybe nudges the market more to 25 basis point cut. But then you had data such as, you know, uh, slightly softer employment. The market was thinking, could it be 50 basis points? But the Fed were actually quite bold and did 50 basis point cut last night. Um, so took rates from five and a half to 5%. It's quite significant because, you know, central banks tend to cut in or move interest rates in 25 basis point increments. So by doing that 50 bip cut it is quite a, a significant move um move lower and again like the bank of england they've been able to cut because you know inflation's come down they're sort of more shifting the focus now to growth um you know growth is holding up but is slowing a little bit so they've just sort of slightly shifted um they are and i think interesting that just really that most of the central banks are committing to doing more interest rate cuts um, quite soon, really. So it seems that certainly in the Federal Reserve's forecasts yesterday, a lot more interest rate cuts in their own forecasts to come before the end of the year. Governor Bailey of the Bank of England was um, slightly pre-committal that there are further interest rate cuts coming soon. Neil, let's bring you in. So if this is all on the back of falling inflation mm -hmm. and falling interest rates, what are we thinking about in terms of the conversations with clients with regards to cash rates and the conversations you're having with clients? Mm. I mean, we've had a lot of focus from clients um, in the last couple of years. Obviously, we've seen the rise in cash rates, um, and a lot of clients have called into True Potential and queried, you know, should I be better going into cash? Um, and, you know, looking at the rates, and the, particularly the last, the last couple of years, we've had difficulty-wise from an investment point of view. Obviously, those questions have come up and we've had we've been having a lot of conversations with clients to say, you know, over the longer term, if you, certainly if you look at a pension and the way that that performs and the discretionary aspect of our own portfolios, um, you know, to remain invested within stocks. And if you historically look at um, stocks at this moment and over the longer term, 
uh, you can see that they provide a better return. Um, see it for a pension. Um, you know, we've got a couple of stats there. Just from a July 2023 point of view, inflation rate of 6.8%. Uh, but if you looked at your average two-year fixed rate for a cash point of view, it's 49 So you've still got the inflationary aspect, which is, um, yes, that's a large cash rate, uh, but you'd still be, you know, remaining sort of from a negative point of view, from a return point of view. And of course, cash rates are coming down now because I'm yeah. one of the um, savings vehicles I've just got for a cash account, that's fallen by quite a bit. It's yeah. fallen more than interest rates have in the UK. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, you should always hold cash um, because, you know, cash is a, an emergency fund, um, you know, or for a shorter term purchase. Whereas, you know, if you looked at a pension, which is, you know, 25, 30 years, 35, even longer sometimes, um, you know, you, you you want that mix of stocks, you want that mix of different assets um, to get you that longer term. And, you know, if you looked at cash rates, maybe it's over a longer term as well. Um, you know, we can see they're significantly lower in the longer term against against investing. Good stuff. So, John, let's bring you in. Um, we've had large spikes in inflation the last couple of years, which has obviously been difficult for clients in the conversations with them. But if we think about the risk of chop and change uh, that we've spoken about before, how do we help clients navigate that journey of just interest rates and inflation both going up and down? Yeah, of course. So I know from conversations I've had with clients in the past when we've got that period of time, you know, Faye mentioned 2022 when inflation was really ramping up. Um, it can have a negative impact on investments and, and portfolios that clients are invested in. Um, it becomes a really difficult topic to navigate when you've perhaps got an investment that in the short term is falling in value and you've got that attraction of potentially slightly higher interest rates that you could get from, say, a cash account. But certainly the conversations that I would tend to have with with customers of ours is, yes, the markets can be volatile. Yes, you know, you might get 4 or 5% in a, a cash account or a savings account, but that isn't what you're investing for. You're not investing to try and pick and choose the best times to be in and out of the market. You're investing for something that's five years away, 10 years away. It's your full retirement. Um, the risk of chopping and changing is you jump out of the market when you've had a, a bit of a rough patch. Yes, you get maybe 4 or 5% for the next year, but if the markets go on a a rally as they, they can and, and do tend to do you you're potentially leaving yourself invested at the worst time and then jumping out when there's potential rewards. So do we had. find in these conversations clients really are just looking for say reassurance or that you know they're just looking for a reason for why markets are a bit choppy and that they can be quite content that equipped with that information then perhaps sometimes doing nothing is the best approach? I think reassurance is the the key part. It, it's you know, if you're sitting on an investment and it's fallen in value by, say, 5% or even 10% in, in a really difficult market, the worry that you would have is, well, well, what if that happens every year? Now, usually that wouldn't tend to be the case. You know, you'd hope that your investment would at some point recover. Um, you know, the investment will always move up and down in value. But I think when you're sitting there and it's your pension and you see it come down in value, there's a natural tendency to think, well, I can't have it doing that forever. Um, so really, it's just reassurance that the market's will often behave in that way and knowing that there is scope for markets to potentially move the other way as well at some point. And you've also got <clears throat> the different attitude to risk of clients. You know, you've got lowest as defensive, which if a client was defensive in every sort of or no risk, you would be in that cash. But if you have a look at pension funds, you know, there's there's no pension funds invested in cash 100% because of the growth factor and historically what they've achieved. So I think it's just about having a conversation with the client and like I said before, you, you, you will hold some cash. You know, I've got cash uh, in the bank that I hold for X, Y, Z. But over the longer term, clients want that return to get, to get you know, that then pension return to the, and to get them retirement goals. So what, how do we, how should we think about then the conversations that may come up with clients who are noticing that cash rates are going down, but also that inflation is more stable and perhaps more representative of where it was pre-COVID, where it was around 2%. Mm, I think clients have historically had very low interest rates and you know they've been used to that yeah and anything that goes up i mean but it's not if you have a look at so if you did a fact find with a client and you looked at their income and expenditure if you've got um high interest rates um they might have just renewed their mortgage and as we know um you know it's it's great for savers but when you're looking at mortgage rates so therefore their mortgage payments might have went up and it's having a conversation about still you know, you're getting this savings rate potentially in cash, but you want it to work over the longer time. And most clients don't um, invest lump sums for their pension. They invest a regular. And, you know, you can benefit from things like, you know, John was talking about low markets and high markets. 
you can you can benefit from pound cost averaging and putting in that amount per 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 month over the longer term, um, which means that also in relation to the market, you don't get that hit. Yeah, and and Faye, that's interesting because Neil mentioned that uh, with higher interest rates, higher mortgage rates, and this feeds into something that you myself the team discussed about this so-called lagged effect of monetary policy and how sometimes the market front runs it. But one of the challenges, I guess, for economies is that longer dated interest rates may not fall as much as shorter dated, dated interest rates, and particularly for mortgage rates, which are more affected by these longer dated interest rates, the economic benefits of falling interest rates may not come through. I'll give you an example. I was looking at mortgage mm-hmm. rates just this morning. In the UK, you're still looking at somewhere close to four and a half, five percent 5%, despite <clears> the fact <throat> interest rates will still be below that. So maybe central bankers will be surprised that the economic stimulus they would expect from lower interest rates doesn't come through immediately. It might take a period of much lower interest rates for longer to feed through. Yeah, yeah. I think you're exactly right there. Yeah. I mean, it's really the lagged impact of monetary policy. It can take quite a while for those effects to actually come through. Yes. And and I think um, just for example, around just before COVID in the the US, you could remortgage for well under 3%. Now you can't really remortgage for below 6%. So despite the fact interest rates appear to be ready to fall quite substantially, our markets have priced that it's not going to come through in some of the more economic sensitive measures. So maybe <clears throat> clients won't feel as well off as they did yeah. prior to COVID. Yeah, I think as well, you've got other things, ancillary things that you have to, clients have to be aware of. Um, if you're going to put savings, you know, a lot of a lot of bank accounts are quite high interest rates at this moment. And a lot of people think, oh, well, my bank account is offering 4.5%, you know. Okay, they want to put the money in there. But... You know, over a certain, if you earn um, a certain amount of money, I think it's over 17,570, you wouldn't get what's known as a starting rate, which is the saving rate of £5,000 of interest, which you're allowed. If you're over 17,570, which most people are in the UK from an income point of view, um, you'll have to pay tax on your savings um, as to whatever whatever they are. And I think the average savings in the UK or earnings in the UK is 35k. So if you've got savings in the bank, um, you'll start paying income tax over a thousand pound rate for basic rate payers and over and five hundred pound for higher rate. That will be added onto your income, and you'll pay interest on. And this is where the benefit of having a financial advisor can make a difference. Because you could wrap that in a nice. Yes, and then you know there are vehicles to protect them. Yeah, absolutely. Faye, let's um, let's bring it back to the true potential portfolios and just think about what our managers have been doing. So to remind our clients that we invest with bespoke portfolios for true potential managed by names such as Goldman Sachs and Picte and in the UK Close Brothers, for example. Um, We've been talking about interest rates a lot with them. What changes have these names been making to the portfolios for the benefits of our clients? Yeah, so we've seen quite a few changes, to be honest. Um, One of the themes I've picked out is managers actually rotating from US government bonds into UK government bonds, um, just given UK gilts, UK government bonds look quite attractively valued compared to US, where you've got a lot more priced into the US in terms of interest rate cuts compared to the UK. So we see managers such as Close Brothers rotating from US treasuries into UK gilts, um, growth aligned and pick day as well, adding to, to gilts last month um, to benefit from that as well. I think Just within equities as well, you've seen um, a few shifts as well. So UBS would be an example of a manager who's been actually reducing their equities back to neutral and they're sort of taking more of a relative value approach to their equity book. So they've been reducing some of the cyclicality um, by reducing like the likes of Japanese and European equities, which have more cyclically exposed industries. And then adding to utilities, so more defensive cash flow businesses, just to kind of reflect some of that more, uh, some of that, their more sort of defensive stance. And this is, I guess this is all quite constructive, isn't it? So if we think about the conversations we've had, the managers switching from US treasuries to government bonds in the yeah. UK are really reflecting that the US has a lot of interest rate cuts priced, whereas the UK doesn't have as many. So whilst they've made a lot of money on the US side, they're hoping to make the same again on the UK side. So it's still constructive. 
yeah. as you said, yeah. UBS on the equity side have effectively booked profits, haven't they? They've, take, they've gone a bit more defensive by just taking some of those more tactical yeah. bets off in the portfolio because US equities in particular did so well through the back end of the summer that they're just sort of taking a breather, aren't they, in the portfolio? And some other managers, as befits their style, looking at some of the more defensive sectors where perhaps they look relatively cheaper mm -hmm. versus other areas which have done very well over the last year or so, which would be tech. So it's more about rotating, isn't it, between styles yeah. and factors, trying to remain fully invested, trying to benefit from these positive returns we're seeing, but also trying to stay just stay in the market. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, lots of examples of just the managers being active and taking opportunities where where they see them. So let's let, let's think about just further retirement planning, Neil, just in terms of how if we're moving back to a lower interest rate environment and if we've seen the beast of inflation as well pass now, um, what what advice should we be thinking about for clients in terms of their savings goals for mm. retirement? What conversations should they be wanting to have with their advisors? Yeah, well, a regular review is always recommended. Um, that's every 12 months. Um, and the conversations we would have about with the client is in relation, you know, we're very goal based. So, you know, how many years have you got till retirement? Has there been any changes in your situation? Can you afford to invest um, more and has your income changed? Um, and, you know, realistically review your attitude to risk as well, because people's attitude to risk can change and does change. Um, it typically goes down as you get older, but not necessarily. It's different for every client. Um, and it's all about building that bigger picture to the client to say, you know, how can we help you hit your retirement goals? The only way it can be done is to speak to an advisor. Um, the tech is very friendly. You can obviously have a look at your goal and set it. Uh, and there's, you know, it'll give you an understanding of where you are and what you need to do in relation to hit that retirement goal. But realistically, speaking to an advisor is, is always key. And like I said, we review that annually. Would we expect just with the returns we're seeing in the portfolios, that some clients might want to have conversations where they think they can bring forward their retirement date just because returns have been yeah potentially quite strong. yeah I mean last year's obviously been really really good from a returns point of view uh, and that will um, soften clients' attitude to you know the negativity what we've had over the last couple of years um, and it may obviously the the results and the better performance things to the think you know present a picture in the client's head. Um, that, you know, they can retire levies a little bit earlier or they might want to keep the retirement date and think, well, if I put some more money into um, this. And, you know, when we're talking about inflation, we're talking about interest rates as well and mortgage rates potentially um, going down gradually. Clients might have a little bit more money to invest. I think something that's really important when we're talking about retirement planning is thinking about inflation. You know, it, it was a hot topic over the last year or two, but if you're thinking about your retirement in however long, 5, 10, 15 years' time, it's all well and good saying, well, you know, I want to retire on £20,000 a year or £25,000 a year. What's really important to bring out when you have a conversation with a financial advisor is £25,000 a year is fine today, but you've got to remember that in 10, 15 years' time, inflation will have had an effect on that money. And when you're building your plan, and again, Neil's referred to the technology, it's really important to, I guess, future-proof that income as well. So... You're thinking about not only how much your pension needs to grow to provide 25000 a year in today's money, but you're thinking about how much it's going to need to grow to to provide that in, in future terms as well. With and the, the, effective and the changes in retirement is, is different. So, you know, you might retire early or you could retire when you're 60 or you might just retire when the state pension age, whatever that is. But you might want to do a lot of stuff when you retire. You know, you might want to go on holidays and you might want to buy this and you might want to buy that. You might want to pay off your mortgage so you'll have financial goals. But generally, as you get later on into retirement and you've got that all out of the way, if you like, you, you, your expenditure tends to go down. So it's all about planning. You know, we do a lot of things like cash flow forecast planning uh, where clients can see the different years and to see what potentially their income will be and how to, you know, plan for that really. But the annual review is key because, you know, you don't want to go five, six years without reviewing that. You need it every year. And John, coming back to you just on something you were saying there, just about the conversations with about inflation with clients. How should we help clients understand the impact of inflation on their savings goals? Yeah, so I, again, I think it's a really important thing to educate our customers on uh, the effect of inflation. It's, it's almost difficult to describe it. If you can imagine you've got, say, 
very simply at a thousand pounds. You know, if I could go out to a shop and, and buy, I don't know what you can buy for a thousand pounds a day, maybe a, a games a console or something like that for a new iPhone. That seems to be iPhone season. So um, if I were to take that thousand pounds and I, I hid it under the mattress, it's not going to grow. If I come back to it in five years time, I'm still going to have my thousand pounds, but it's, it's very unlikely that I'll be able to go out to the shop and buy the same thing that I could today because inflation will have meant that the price of that item will have increased over those five years. Now, um, you can put that £1,000 in a, a savings account, and if your interest rate is relatively similar to the rate of inflation, then it should keep pace with the, the rate that things are increasing in price. And then you've got things like investments, which if you are willing to take a little bit of risk, there's the potential for a, a higher return at the back of it. So again, over those five, 10-year periods, the idea of having an investment is that it will grow by hopefully four, five, six percent a year above the rate of inflation. Um, and when you come to use that money in the future, not only has your money maintained its purchasing power, but you've achieved a return above that and you've actually made money on the investment is, is exactly. the ideal. And Neil, as, as we were discussing earlier, if you if you can stay invested for a reasonable enough time horizon, your mm-hmm. investments can beat inflation yeah. in the long run. And so just thinking, John, so you mentioned there we've got inflation and risk, which takes us Faye, into how we think about both of those in terms of portfolios. It's diversification, yeah. mm-hmm. true potential, have the have you know our unique selling point is advanced diversification using the managers we have available to us to diversify portfolios. How sh- how do we think about diversification though within the investment team and u- using these managers? Yeah, good question. So we take a as you say multi manager approach to to diversification, um, and we invest across asset classes as well. So we invest across equities, bonds, alternatives. So. Equities, you know, tend to provide the highest long-term expected return. It's quite a supportive backdrop for equities as well. So good to have a, a good equity allocation in there. But uh, we also have bonds as well because they can act as quite a useful diversifier to equities. So they tend to be negatively correlated to equities. So when your equities are down, your bonds can actually uplift performance and also lower the volatility of your overall portfolio as well. Um but it's important to remember that's that's not always the case. Sometimes you can have um, periods where your equities and bonds are actually positively correlated, um, as we did see, you know, in recent times when we had inflation spiking, you had you know positive equity bond correlations. So that's why we also have that allocation to alternatives. So that would be things like gold, um, hedge funds as well, um, which can again another diversification source source of return yes and these alternative strategies can work in both environments can they it's not yeah. just they just don't it's not that they just need equities to fall to outperform it's as we're saying for a number of strategy, strategies such as even gold this year yeah. doing remarkably well versus equities and of course let's not downplay it it's not just the managers who are doing and adding a lot of value for true potential clients it's yourself chris george and the team who are moving capital across these managers depend on our view and how we think it's perhaps complements or contradicts the managers themselves. So we're, we're making active decisions yeah. in addition to the managers as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So a good example of that would be maybe start of this year, uh, we were adding to Goldman Sachs Income Builder, just given we wanted a higher allocation to high yield, something that we anticipate would perform quite well in the upcoming environment. And that's and one that's- of the best performing funds in the yeah. wealth strategy range this year. Yes. Exactly. So that that's excellent. There's a lot there to, to recap. So we we appear to be in a new regime for interest rates. Certainly, inflation has been low for most of this year in most major economies, and interest rates are beginning to follow down. And we've had this commitment, certainly in the last day and a half, from two major central banks to perhaps look at lower interest rates again before the end of the year. Neil and the team should probably be thinking that they're going to receive more calls from clients, just as how do they be- be- best manage their savings with falling interest rates and with inflation more under control. And as John mentioned, there's a lot to consider just about beating inflation, thinking about risk in this context of uh, lower interest rates. We're not don't appear to be moving back to the pre-COVID regime of interest rates extremely low, but certainly appear to have interest rates ahead going much lower. And that's benefiting portfolios for true potential clients as we see today. So thank you very much for joining us today. Please do like and subscribe on the YouTube channel. Please also leave some comments where we can pick up on your questions if you want to speak to an advisor. Please also have a look out for another 
video today where it's the week in markets with my colleague Paul Durrance and they will recap there everything we've heard from central banks this week and how and what impact it should have on the portfolios. So that's all for today. Please take care and enjoy your weekends. Thank you. This video is not a recommendation or personal financial advice. With investing, your capital is at risk. Investments can fluctuate in value and you may get back less than you invest.